My name's John. I'm an alcoholic. I'm one drink away from a drunk. It's good to be here. It's good to be sober. Laughing Bear, Mary Allen, Tom Wicks, Joanne, Melissa, Jersey Joe. It's another Saturday night and we're still sober. Can you believe it? I was born, I was born in a log cabin in rural Kentucky. No, I'm just kidding. That was Abraham Lincoln and Oft Told Tales of Lincoln. Uh, one of my favorite books when I was a child. I was born here in Chicago in the Chicago Foundlings home. I was, uh, I, uh, my, my birth mother was an itinerant young 22 year old woman from the Seattle, Washington and raising, a, raising a, a, an infant, an illegitimate child when the uh, father has uh, split on you in 1957 wasn't exactly a politically correct thing to do. So she dropped me off at the Foundlings home and I spent my first year of life there until uh, the uh, folks <clears throat> allowed this crazy couple, Bob and Annette, to adopt me. They, Bob and Annette had been uh, denied adoption rights three times. Bob was a World War II combat veteran. He was uh, 19 when he landed at Normandy and fought his way through France and Germany into Upper Austria. And he had probably what we call uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Now, Bob spent the first 14 years of my life trying to kill me. And Annette, uh, my adoptive mother, was a bipolar paranoid schizophrenic who was subject to very frequent and severe psychotic breaks that led to her institutionalization on numerous occasions when I was a young child. And I spent the time when I wasn't getting my ass kicked by Bob up in my room. I had uh, a room above a garage. I had shutters. Um, Candace has shutters that, that reminded me. She, I had shutters in these windows and I'd stay hidden in my room and read, uh, read my books, oft told tales of Lincoln, things like that. The little engine that could was my favorite. I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And I would wait and I'd hear a car come by at night and I'd, I'd look out and it wasn't my father. So I knew I wasn't gonna get my ass kicked yet. And every car that came by, I'd pull up the little shutter and it wasn't Bob. I wasn't going to get, and then I hear the garage door. I lived above the garage. So I heard the garage door open and I'm like, yep, it, the ass kicking is coming. So I knew what was going to happen. I had my first drink. I mean, I had a strange, a, a very strange childhood. Uh, they, I, I grew up in a house where it was, uh, it wasn't uncommon where the, everything appeared to be normal, nice house, nice lawn, nice looking people, nice clothing, nice cars, but inside it was a, it was a horrible place to live and nothing was real. Um, I, uh, I started drinking when I was about 13 or 14. I remember the first time I got loaded. I was, uh, actually the first time I got loaded was in sixth grade. I didn't think about this for a long time. I thought about it today. A kid, a kid from across the street, Ricky Britton and I, we came home. We were walkers from school. And we, we went into my father's liquor cabinet. And we put a shot of just about everything into a tall tumbler. And uh, Ricky sipped it and spit it out. And he said, that, you know, that's gross. I chugged it. And uh, we walked back to school. And I got uh, sent home. An aunt of mine had to pick me up. And and uh, they, they, you know, kept watch on me for a couple of days. Nobody ever said anything to me about what had happened. Not a word. They pretended like it didn't happen. There's no way they couldn't have known. I had no recollection of it. Uh, the first time I drank, I drank alcoholically and I drank myself into a blackout. When I was, uh, when I was 14, I went out to a New Year's Eve party um, with a bottle of Glenfiddich. It stuck into my pants out of my father's liquor cabinet. It was a full fresh bottle of Glenfiddich. And about one o'clock in the morning, they peeled me off the Homewood Police, Homewood, Illinois Police Department, peeled me off of a 20 foot water fountain that was in this apartment complex in the center of it. It was the middle of a snowstorm. I was naked on top of this thing. And I, I guess I told the police officers that I was searching for God. And they took me into the station and cut me loose. And, and from then on, it was, you know, the drinking. I got beaten up a lot by my dad, and uh, it, it one night it was a particularly bad beating. He had me on the on, on my back on the floor in my bedroom, and he had me pinned. His his knees were in my in my shoulders, and he was punching me roundhouse punches left and right. 
And Annette was hanging on him, trying to get him off, screaming at him, Bob, you're going to kill him. A little light bulb in my head went off. <laughs> if I don't leave, they're going to kill me. And the next day I left. And I spent, uh, I spent a, almost a week um, in a studio apartment with a 19-year-old sister of a classmate of mine. And uh, after a, a, a week, <laughs> you know, I learned a lot of things in a very short period of time. And I got sick of it real quick. So I, I moved downtown. And I, I, I wound up, I, 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 got, I got a room at the Lawson YMCA on Chicago Avenue, at, you know, a, a very tall, uh, tall building. I don't remember, it's maybe 30 floors, old Gothic brick building. Uh, it wasn't Gothic, it was uh, whatever it was. I, I lived in there. I was 14 years old and uh, I drank and I peddled my ass on the streets on the north side and hustled and stole and lied and connived and stealed and if they were men or women, if they were going to give me a warm place and a couple of couple of bucks or 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 or whatever I could talk their way out of, <clears throat> they could rent me. And that's the way that worked. And I ultimately uh, showed up one day uh, and there was a little red plug in my door, in my lock on my door. They plugged me out. I couldn't I couldn't pay the rent. And uh, I hocked my I had a pair of boots. It was a nice pair of fry boots. And I, it was winter time, and I, I remember this. I, I was wearing tennis shoes, and it was a sloppy Chicago winter day. And I, I walked down, and I pawned my last, my pawned my fry boots, and they gave me enough money to get a six pack of half quarts of old style. And I drank those and got a little bit above a buzz, and I had 15 cents left. I, I had no place to go, and I, I walked into the McDonald's on the corner of Wabash and State, no, the corner of Wabash and Division. <clears throat> Wabash in Chicago, and I had 15 cents. And I remember walking up to the counter and asking the lady, how much was a bun? And I bought the bun, and the bun was 10 cents. And I went over to the condiment thing, and I loaded up on rehydrated onions and pickle relish and mustard and ketchup, and I sat down at that bench. I had nowhere to go. Well, I wound up in a dumpster. <clears throat> I wound up in a dumpster behind 1220 North State Parkway. And I was too dirty and filthy to pedal my ass anymore. But the guys, at, the Mexicans at Chester's Pizza in the kitchen, they kept me, they kept me fed. And I, a couple of homeless people and Joanne, Joanne, her name was Joanne. And she, she was a thalidomide uh, child back in the 50s. And they, they, anyway, she had fingers coming out of her shoulders. And Joanne was a street person. And Joanne took me under her wing. And, and uh, they made sure I didn't die. And I lived in the dumpster for... I, it, it's probably close to two years. When I was 17 and a half, I was drinking alcoholic the whole time, hooking, jabbing, hustling, conniving, you know, rent boy, all the, you know, darkness. Um, when I was a child, the, the one thing that I feared from the stories that I read was the darkness. And I fell into a, I fell into a, a deep, deep, dark hole. And there was no coming out of that one. Um, one day, I walked down to the Clark Street Armed Forces Entrance Examination State Station. It was in the Standard Oil Building on South Michigan Avenue. And I walked into the Marine Corps recruiter. I'm dirty, got hair down to my shoulders, 17 and a half years old. And I walked in the Marine Corps and I said, excuse me, sir, I'd like to know some information about joining the Marine Corps. And the guy behind the desk looks at me and he says, <clears throat> Young man, I want you to tuck in your hair. I want you to tuck in your shirt. I want you to straighten your gig line, tighten your belt, walk out that door, come back in that door, walk up to my desk, stand there at attention and say, Sergeant, I want to be a Marine. And I looked at him and I said, fuck you. And I walked out and I hit the elevator button. I got down, I opened up and there was a six foot six African-American United States Army Sergeant first class in his dress green uniform. He was an Airborne Ranger Special Forces. And his name was Sergeant First Class Oliver. And he said, young man, where are you going? And I proceeded to tell him what had just happened. And I'm, they had these tall aluminum uh, ashtrays outside of elevators back then. And that's where I got my cigarettes. And I was picking out cigarettes and he reached over and he offered me a cool cigarette out of a pack. And he said, what do you want to do with your life, young man? And I said, I, you know, I don't know. I was thinking about, you know, someday I want to go to Germany. And he said, we can arrange that. And 12 hours later, I was standing at three o'clock in the morning in combat boots, boxer shorts with a shaved head and a 75 pound duffel bag on my back in the company street 
at Alpha Company, 3rd Battalion, 1st Brigade, top of the tank, Tank Hill, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And there was another six foot six black guy telling me that for the next 12 weeks, I was he was going to be my mommy, my daddy, my father, my God, my wife, my girlfriend. And he was going to make me a United States Army soldier, whether it, whether it killed me or not. And he did. And that was the longest period of enforced sobriety that I'd had since I was about 13 or 14 years old. I went to airborne, went to infantry school, went to airborne training, and I was waiting on orders. I was supposed to go to the 509th Airborne Infantry in Vicenza, Italy, when I got called to the brigade commander's office. And I thought, uh-oh, either they found me or somebody's dead. And I walk into this full bird colonel's office and he says, we were looking at your file and we want you to take a test. And I said, okay. And I sent me down to a Quonset hut and I reeled a real tape recorder and I opened up the test booklet and it's a test to, to measure my ability to learn a foreign language. And it was Esperanto. I opened up the test booklet and it's Esperanto. Esperanto was a language invented by a Polish oculist at the turn of the 20th century. It was going to be the universal scientific language. I taught myself Esperanto with one of those little blue, you know, it was before the idiot books. They used to have these little blue books and in 87 pages, you could teach yourself nuclear physics, you know, Feynman's notebooks in a nutshell. And I'd learned a little bit of Esperanto. I got through the test and I maxed the test and, you know, Here's another story. The Army can be efficient. 24 hours later, I was at um, the Defense Language Institute Foreign Language Center in Monterey, California. And I was checking in with my duffel bag. It was a Friday night. And I, the charge of quarters gave me the key to my room. My room was on the fourth floor at Company C. I got up the hallway. I walked down. And there's a beer machine next to my door. I dropped my duffel bag. I went back down to the first floor. I said, Sergeant, where can I get a roll of quarters? I got a roll of quarters, I got my beers, I let myself into my room, and I was in the right place at the right time. It wasn't too long, I, I, they put me in the, the Russian course. It was a self-paced, I think it was 58 weeks. I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't read music, I certainly can't carry a tune, I can't talk to women very well, but I found out I could learn languages. And I got through that Russian course in record time, and I proficiencyed out of it, the State Department proficiency exam, and I tested out as native bilingual. And uh, they put me in the German, in the uh, Polish course because my security clearance wasn't done. My background was too spotty. And uh, I finished the Polish course and I still didn't have a clearance. So they put me through the German course. And I finished the German course and uh, I got orders. I, 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 was, I was tutoring a, I waiting for the security clearance to get straightened out. I was tutoring uh, uh, senior officers. I, I had a colonel that I had to teach. He was in something called the Gateway Program. It was an eight-week program. New commanders of brigade, colonel or above, who were going to Germany had to go to DLI and learn the basics of this lang of a language. And I was teaching. His name was J. Barry Williams. He was a full bird colonel. He was crazy. He was a former deputy commander of the 82nd Airborne Division, where I where I went to airborne training. And uh, he was on his way to become the commander of the 66th Military Intelligence Battalion in Munich, operating out of the Columbia Hotel. And he was good friends with this three star uh, up in Frankfurt. Anyway, I got orders and they were going to send me to a cryptological intercept station uh, up up up, up uh, in, a, in, a, in a place where it's very, very cold. And I got upset and Colonel Williams got upset and he says, nope, you're not going, you're not going to any cryptological intercept station. You're going to Germany. Next morning, there's a banging on my door and I answered the door. I had a woman in the room, which was kind of against the rules, but I, I opened the door and there's my captain and my first sergeant. And the captain looks at me and he says, who do you know? And I says, sir. And the first sergeant says, well, there's a good news and the bad news. I said, well, what's the good news? He says, the good news is you're going to headquarters United States Army Europe in Germany. I said, what's the bad news? He says, your flight leaves San Francisco in four hours. Okay, so I said goodbye to the girl. They got me to the airport. I land in Germany and I'm working for a three-star general. And my first assignment, um, they were all drinkers. And they were, I mean, I, I hit the ground running. I remember we were coming on the bus 
coming out of Rhineline Air Force Base, going down to the to the uh, 21st Replacement Battalion, downtown Frankfurt. It was about eight o'clock in the morning and there were German workers on the side of the road and they were drinking beer and eating sandwiches. And I thought, I'm in the right place. And I stayed drunk and I started getting into little bits of trouble. I, uh, I had a, my own van. I had a, a VW transporter van. It was, you know, a little VW micro van and it had a conference table and six chairs in the back and it had a radio telephone and it was mine I, my job was to go on the ground wherever the general was going to be I'd go in advance and arrange with local national law enforcement for security that would augment the military police security for the general's visit and uh, I, I would drink you know I made it I, I, I would drink I would drive drunk I would get drunk and go drive to where I was supposed to be. And uh, sometimes I was in a blackout, sometimes not. I mastered it. I never got caught driving and, and drinking. I learned that if I took my head and stuck it against the door jam like this and closed my right eye, my lane was always the one on the bottom and it never failed me. And I would wake up in peculiar places, naked, sprawled out over the conference table, covered in urine in the middle of a field out in the middle of nowhere on a Sunday morning. With no idea how I got there. Get cleaned up, get back to the barracks and make it every time until it started not to work anymore. Um, the military culture back then was the, the army was drunk in the 1970s and the 1980s. The army was just drunk and I was happy to be a part of it. When I was at the, the Defense Language Institute, one telling moment, um, I learned that I was an alcoholic. I, uh, I was in a day room one night, I was drunk and I was telling somebody to do something and there was this young girl, she was a private and, and she wasn't in my language, but I told her to do something and she looked at me and she yelled at me. She said, oh, shut up, you're nothing but an alcoholic. And it was just like she hit me in the face with a baseball bat and there was nothing I could say. And I knew she had me dead, dead to right. I went, uh, went to the club at DLI a lot. And uh, one night, I, I, things got out of hand. I woke up, I made it back to the barracks though. I was convinced because I woke up under a green army blanket and I thought to myself, oh Jesus, I made it, I made it back to the barracks wherever I was, but I was wet. And I moved and I could feel something crinkle. And then I heard that unmistakable sound of steel against steel. And I pulled that blanket off and I was in a jail cell. And I had no idea why. And I sat up and I sat there for, I don't know for how long, and I was absolutely terrified. And this beefy sergeant came in, keys jingling, and big pot bell, and he says, you ready to go? And I said, go where? And he said, home, we're going to cut you loose. And on the way out, I stopped by the desk. I'm looking over the counter and said, excuse me, but wh wh why, why was I here? And he read me that that he read to me that they'd found me. Or it was very very early in the morning, two or three o'clock in the morning, in front of U.S. Highway One, which is a couple of hundred yards away from our NCO club at the Presidio of Monterey. And I had a full mug of beer in my hand, and I was trying to light it with a cigarette lighter. And I told the officer that I was an Army nuclear physicist and that I discovered an untapped source of energy, but I couldn't get the goddamn lighter to work. And then when they told me they were going to take me to be safe, take me in, and I told the guy he didn't know who I was, and he cracked me over the head and put me in the car. I went to an AA meeting that afternoon when they let me out, and it was in the Alano Club on Alvarado Street in Monterey. And there was, room was filled with young men, and they were all talking about not drinking, and they actually bought me and handed me a copy of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. They're all, you know, all handsome young men. And about halfway through this meeting, it, it, it dawned on me, I was in a gay men's meeting. And um, this, for a soldier who was waiting for a top secret special compartmental access background investigation, this was not the place to be in 1977 or 1978. So I left the meeting, I didn't go back. I went back to the barracks and got drunk, but I kept the big book. And in Germany, when things started going sour, I would drink. I would go to work, I would drink, and on the weekends, I would get hammered. And I remember one particular night, it might have been one particular morning, I was in my barracks room in building 3102 at Daner Kasern on, Pan on Mannheimer Straße in Kaiserslautern, Germany. And I was naked on my bed, 
And I had the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that they'd given me in that meeting in Monterey. I had it in my left hand. I was reading it. And I had a liter bottle of Barbarossa brew, a German beer that was made in Kaiserslautern, big green bottle, had it in my right hand. And I was talking to the big book and to the bottle. Not in my mind, I was talking out loud. We were having a conversation. And I asked them both which one of them was going to win. Was I going to get sober in Alcoholics Anonymous or was I going to drink myself to death? And I think it was the same time that I sat there and I was looking at my wall and I realized that I could no longer laugh. I couldn't laugh anymore. I'd lost the ability to laugh. And that really, really made me sad. Well, one morning I told my Sergeant Major, I said, Sergeant Major, I got a dental appointment. I'll see you later. And he said, go ahead. And I was gone for three and a half weeks and nobody knew where I was. I didn't know where I was, but I was out drinking. And this went from August into mid-September of 1983. And uh, one night I was on a train I was, I don't know, I, 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 every time I talk about it, I try and pin down where it was. It might've been in France. It might've been in Belgium. It, it was probably in France. I was on a high-speed trans-European train, a tube train, and I was in a blackout. And it was, I was in one of those blackouts where you come in and out. It's like watching a, a black and white French noir movie. And I'm sitting in the audience watching myself out of control, completely, totally, utterly out of control. And I'm trying to kill myself. I'm trying to, I'm jumping up out of my seat. I'm running toward the door and I can't turn the door handles because the train's moving. So I start kicking the door and I'm trying to kick the door so I can jump out and throw myself out and kill myself. And the Germans keep gr grabbing me and pull me back. I got, I come out of the blackout and I got this big fat German sitting on top of me and I'm trying to wriggle out. I'm up again. I'm trying to kick out the doors. People are screaming, slam me down again. I black out. I come out of the blackout and I'm, I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in the seat and the train's going and I'm looking at the perforated floorboard, the perforated metal floor by the, by the train exit, by the car exit. And I'm crying. I am crying. I'm absolutely terrified. I know that tonight I'm gonna die. And I'm absolutely, I'm stricken with, with terror. And I was absolutely helpless. It was the first time in my life, notwithstanding anything I'd ever been through, it's the first time in my life that I ever felt absolutely helpless. And I said the first erstwhile prayer I'd ever said in my life, I said, God, and I said it out loud, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I'm crying like a baby. I don't want to die. Please save me. I don't want to die. And I blacked out again. And I came, as I was coming out of that blackout, I was stepping off that train and I stepped down onto cobblestone, brown cobblestone on a pl train platform. And I looked up and it said, Kaiser Slaughter and Hauptbahnhof, Kaiser Slaughter and main train station. And it was, it was the middle of the night, it was bright as day. And I looked at the clock and it said 10, 10 p.m. And I looked up and the sky was light and bright. And I yelled out at the top of my lungs in the train station, okay, I got the message. And I knew it was done. It was 10, 10 p.m., September 19th, 1983. And it was done. I walked out of the train station into the Gaststätte zum Goldener Flug was the name. It's a, a bar, kind of like a Gasthaus bar, right across from the Kaiserslautern train station. The Gaststätte zum Goldener Flug. Incidentally, zum Goldener Flug in German means at the golden plug. <laughs> and I ordered my last two beers and I drank them, shot them down. And I called my friend Klaus to come pick me up. He was the, the father of the German family that had me for Thanksgiving and Christmas as a host nation family. And uh, Klaus, I didn't have the money. He paid for the beers. And I remember he's looking at me. He's in the driver's seat. And he just looked over at me. And he just, just shook his head with disappointment and dropped me off at the barracks. Got to the barracks. And when I came to, I was 
opened my eyes and I, I, uh, all I could see was a horizontal strip of light and I just laid there and I was terrified again because I thought I'd, I'd gone ahead and drunk myself blind and I was cold and I realized I was naked on the floor in a pool of my piss on a linoleum floor on the fourth floor looking out into the hallway from underneath my door and I got up cleaned up put on my uniform and I uh, I walked out of the building it was pitch black it's probably three or four in the morning and I walked uh, I was on the Kasern, which is an installation where I live was on Mannheimer Straße and it was about a mile a mile a mile and a half a kilometer and a half away from our headquarters Panzer Kasern. and I was walking down on the side of of Mannheimer Straße, which was a two lane highway. And there was a little path, little dirt gravel path along the side from our installation to the headquarters installation. And I was talking to myself out loud. I kept repeating to myself over and over and over, who bit the donkey? Who bit the donkey? Who bit the donkey? Makes absolutely no sense. And I knew when I was saying it, that it made no sense. And I knew that I completely lost my mind and that I'd gone mad. And I went into the headquarters and I, I went into the general, the SGS, which is secretary of the general staff officers. And I went into the chief of staff's office and sat down in his chair. He was my direct supervisor. He was a full bird colonel. His name was Robert Drudick. He, he later retired as a, as a major general. He was a decorated Vietnam veteran. He'd always treated me like a son. And uh, I sat in his desk chair and the light flicked on sometime later, and there was Colonel Drudick, and he just looked at me, and he gave me that, you know, that sort of disturbed fatherly look, and I just started bawling again, and I said, I said, sir, I'm either, I'm either psychotic or I'm an alcoholic, and he just said, yep, and uh, he called the duty driver, and they drove me over to Claybrook Cern, and I checked into the community drug and alcohol counseling center, and I met this lady, her name was Suzanne Rohde. She was this kind of portly, school marmish looking, early middle-aged, de dependent wife of an of a Air Force colonel. And she was a social worker and she was gonna do my intake. We're still friends, by the way. I call her every Christmas and tell her that if it wasn't for her, I'd be dead. And anyway, uh, halfway through my interview, I'm crying, she's crying. She reaches over and touches me on the knee and she says, John, are you making any of this up? And I just started bawling. And she sent me up to, uh, with another duty driver, they sent me to Landstuhl Army Regional Medical Center, which is in Landstuhl. And uh, I got admitted to One Delta, which is the psychiatric unit. And they, uh, they gave me a shot in the ass and they kept me on that, that uh, miracle medicine, uh, Thorazine, for about five days. I sat in an overstuffed chair in front of a television inside of a plywood box with plexiglass over it so we wouldn't steal the television, climb out the second floor window and make an escape. And I watched Beastmasters, which was a book, uh, it's a movie about it. It was the only Betamax that they had. It was a movie about a, a guy in a loincloth who communicates telepathically with animals. And I watched it every day, five or six times a day for five days. And on day number five, this little black man comes into the, the psych unit and he says, does anybody want to go to an A&A &A meeting? And I looked over at him and I tried to raise, I tried to raise my hand. I couldn't move my arms. Thorazine is some powerful medicine. And I could, he just laughed and said, I'll come get you tomorrow. And he did. And he took me to the back gate guard shack. They had, a, a, they had an Air Force security officer escort him and me to the back gate uh, at, the, at the launch tool to the guard shack. And uh, we're in the basement and we walked in, there's a girl named Shelly. And she says, gives me a hug and says, my name's Shelly, I'm an alcoholic. I haven't had a drink in more than 30 days. And she was missing a couple of teeth and she was cute. And I, you know, I was gonna ask her for a number at the end of the meeting, but I think I forgot. But in that meeting, I don't remember much what would have happened. I just remember I felt warm, I felt comfortable and I felt encouraged. But at the end of that meeting, there was a man in that room. His name was Philadelphia Bill Robinson. And he was from Glen Olden, Pennsylvania. He'd arrived in Germany the day before for a two week visit with his son, Kevin, who was his airman stationed at Ramstein Air Force Base. And Bill had been sober for 28 years. And at the end of that meeting, 
He grabbed me by my lapels of my hospital robe. I weighed 118 pounds. I had jaundice. I couldn't speak in complete sentences. I'd been diagnosed with significant clinical cognitive impairment. And this guy grabs me and, and he, this is exactly what he said to me. He said, kid, you don't ever have a drink again, as long as you live, because you're an Alcoholics Anonymous now. And if you go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you work to get a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you get a sponsor and start working at 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and if you don't pick up that first drink, nope, not even if your balls fall off. Things will happen to you beyond your wildest imagination, and all your dreams will come true. And he had me. He had me. And I felt, I, you know, he had me. And I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to meetings every day. Bill picked me up at launch tool at the hospital. They put me on a medical ward. I was on a medical ward for six, close to six months till I got well enough to send back to duty. Bill stayed for six months and picked me up every day. And he took me back every day. He took me to Ramstein to the bowling alley where we sat around drinking coffee. They, they take me to meetings at eight o'clock at night. They bring me to the bowling alley at 12, 10 o'clock at night. We drink coffee and eat French fries with mayonnaise and bad pizza till two o'clock in the morning. They take me back to the unit and then I'd wonder why I couldn't fall asleep. And that went on for a long, long time. And he took me through the steps. And he was teaching me, you know, and I'd come in and say, Bill, they're just, they're messing with me and they're doing this and they're, they're making me do, Johnny, just quit your bitching. As long as somebody's kicking you in the ass, you're still out in front of them, you know, or Johnny, stop lying to yourself. You're sober. You didn't drink today, did you? No. Well, then quit your bitching and do the work, you know, and things like that, you know, and Bill left and he turned me over to Ramstein Charlie. The, the little black guy who took me to the first AA meeting, Ramstein Charlie, had 16 years of sobriety. And Ramstein Charlie, would I had breakfast with him every morning um, at the uh, Fogelway uh, AFES snack bar next to the PX. We had breakfast every morning. And, and Charlie, Charlie was, uh, he was a retired Air Force uh, NCO, and he was a very humble guy. And he always had an answer, and it usually involved laughter. And Charlie would tell me that anything was possible in sobriety. Bill would tell me anything was possible in sobriety. And I sat on my fourth step for a long, long time. One, two, and three, it didn't take much for me. The higher power, you know, I wrestled with that. I really wrestled with it. And, 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 and what first connected me was somebody in a meeting at Capone Air Station, which was halfway between Fogelway and, and Launchstool. Somebody talked this, 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 this uh, talks about a guy, this Indian. He said, a guy, drunken Indian, went up on a mountain and he shook his fist at heaven and he screamed out, believe in God, you show me and I'll believe. And nothing happened. And he turns around, he says, ha, I knew it. And he's walking down the mountain and all of a sudden the sky opens up and this big booming voice says, believe and I will show you. And I believed. That's, that's all it took. I started to believe. They told me, write down a prayer. So I wrote, I, I spent some time, probably a whole day, writing a prayer. And I came up with a prayer. And I've said the prayer every day, morning and night, for the past 38 years. God, thank you for the past 24 hours of sobriety and for giving me the strength, the courage, and the faith not to take that first drink one day at a time. I pray, Lord, that during these next 24 hours, you grant me the strength, the courage, and the faith not to take that first drink one day at a time, and that you grant me peace. And my mission began and continues to this day to be to make it to my bed and hit my pillow sober tonight. And it's so far, it's working. Fourth step was a challenge. I carried it around with me for a long time. It ultimately wound up being nine legal pads, the long yellow ones of stuff, because I heard that if you didn't do a thorough fourth and fifth, you were going to drink again. And I knew that if I was going to drink again, I was going to die. And before long, I, uh, I found a person that I knew I would never see again when I left Germany. He was the husband of an Air Force accounting officer. His name was Rich. We're still in touch today. Rich is still sober. And Rich, Rich decided, okay, we're going to have you out to Ramstein officer quarters. I'll listen to your fifth step. We started on Friday afternoon after duty, maybe about five o'clock. 
and between meals and sleep and cigarette breaks. And he listened to me talk until about 3 a.m. Sunday morning when I finally finished up. And uh, I went outside to smoke a cigarette. It was uh, between Christmas and New Year's of 1984. It was Ramstein Air Force Base. There was a snowstorm that night. And I walked out onto this field next to where the officer housing was. And I could see that the, the Ramstein flight line that was shut down, but the border lights that, that, that bordered the flight line, the runway, they were on. And it was a storybook German Christmas fat snowflakes. You could barely see through them. You could see the lights, but they were all glistening and it was perfectly quiet. And I lit up a cigarette and I stood there. And for the first time, since I was a small, small child, I was at total, complete peace. I was, it was gone. All of it was gone. And life went on. I stood in a Ramstein Chapel eating meeting one night in the kitchen. Chapel 2, third Saturday of the month, the eating meeting. Uh, about January of 1985, and I was going to get out of the army, and I said, Charlie, I'm terrified. He says, why are you terrified, John? I said, Charlie, I don't know if I can make it without the army. Like, John, if 325 million Americans can make it without the motherfucking army, so can you. And I thought, you're right, I can. So I got out and I had this harebrained scheme. You know, I was a high school dropout. I'm gonna, I got a GED, I'm gonna go to college. And I applied to all the good ones and I got in and I got off the train and I, I uh, I went to college. Me. The first night, of, the, the, first, the first class I had was introdu introductory symbolic logic. P implies Q, if P then Q. Q is equivalent to P, if Q then P, if P then Q. To, six weeks into an eight week summer school course, I'm sitting at my desk sweating it because they lost me. They lost me in the first class in the first week and we're in week six and I didn't get it. And uh, six hours, and you know, a night, I would sit there. And finally, one night, about 10 o'clock at night, all of a sudden, it clicked. And I got it. And I understood. And I jumped up and I started screaming, screaming with thanks. And uh, the people that I'd rented, I was living on a porch, the back porch of a house. And, uh, and the people that I was renting from thought I was nuts. But I understood it. And I did well in school. I wound up on an academic scholarship. And I got a degree in medieval German literature. And I got another one in political science. And I decided, well, I'm going to apply to graduate school. And I got in and I went and got a graduate degree in philosophy. And then I figured, oh, I'm going to be a lawyer. So I went and applied to the great law schools. And I got into law school. And I re reconciled with Bob and Annette. And I recognized that the two parents that I had been given, they did the best they could with the skills that they had, and I forgave them. I didn't forgive them out of some altruistic desire to become um, holy with the, the one mysterious force in the universe. I, I forgave them because I was told that if I wanted to stay sober, I had to learn how to forgive people who had harmed me. And I really did forgive them. Um, my second year of law school, my father asked me, he said, what do you want to do when you become a lawyer? I said, someday I want to argue a case in front of the United States Supreme Court. And he went off on me. He was still a son of a bitch. But he went off on me and he told me I was being unrealistic, that I was being unrealistic in a fantasy and that I'd not changed at all. In second year of law school, my partner, Bob Dole and I, we won the national moot court competition. It was a case that was a moot case that every law student in the country was arguing in a moot court competition. And we won. And the, the prize was we got to argue the moot case in front of the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> so off we went. And uh, when it came time, you know, you, they have a traffic light. It's a red and green, red, yellow and green. And, you know, it gives you your, your time on your three minutes before it started. I introduced myself and I said, my name, my name is so-and-so. And it almost came out. It almost came out. And I'm an alcoholic, but it didn't. I said, I represent the plaintiff. And I turned around and I looked in the spectator gallery and Bob, my, my father was sitting there looking smug as a smug as a bug in a rug. And uh, that was a highlight. But I remember 
I, I remember standing out in front with Bob and uh, the, the feeling that I didn't belong there. It, it, it didn't happen that I wasn't sober all that long. I think it was about eight or nine years of sobriety. And I got out of law school and uh, I got a great job. I got a great job working for a, a great law firm in Chicago and, and a very lucrative time. Um, I got married. I got married to a woman who's not in the program. Um, that doesn't have anything wrong with her. And uh, we've uh, raised five children. I have a, I have a, I have a 32 year old son, a, a 31 year old son, two 28 year old girls and a 16 year old. No, never touched a single one of them in anger. Um, and Bob and Annette, we took care of them and, until they died. Shortly before Bob died, he, he, was, he had a five year battle with multiple myeloma. Um, and uh, I was, took him to Northwestern one night and uh, he was getting some transfusions and he told me to get his pants and he had his wallet and he hands me a, he hands me a piece of paper and it's got a combination. And I said, what's this? <clears throat> and he said, there's a, there's, a, there's a vault box up in the floorboards of the attic hidden up there. Go, go up there and get it out of there before anybody finds it. So I did. And after he died, it sat in my study next to my desk for about six months. And my wife kept after me, you're going to open it, you're going to open it, you're going to open it, you're going to open it. So I, I opened it. And when I opened it, I found uh, all of his secrets. And 347 letters between him and the love of his lifetime, who was not my mother. And I found an envelope with my name on it, which contained my original adoption court pleadings from the Circuit Court of Cook County and in Chicago which uh, he wasn't supposed to have, but he had them. And uh, I identified who my birth mother was and I found her. And that was uh, August 24th, 2012. I wrote her an email and I'll tell you, I, I mean, I'd like to read you the email. This is the, because this is, tells my story. Dear Virginia, greetings from John in Chicago. I'm filled with trepidation sending you this message. As a matter of fact, I'm shaking and trembling. Please let me explain. On May 7th, 2012, my father died in his 86th year after a five-year wrestling match with multiple myeloma. Before he died, he gave me uh, the keys, uh, the combination to a lockbox vault. He didn't tell me what was in it. He and I had a very, very tough relationship since I was a small child. But he did tell me I should read the contents of the boxes after his death. I've read most of the documents in the boxes, all of the letters he wrote home to his mother when he was an infantryman plotting through France and Germany during World War II, his complete secret correspondence with the love of his life, not surprisingly, not my mother, and all of the Circuit Court of Cook County and Chicago Foundling Homes documentation surrounding my arrival into his and my mother's lives sometimes in 1958. My parents told me that I was not their child when I was very small, but I've always known that they were not my parents. So when I came across my original unredacted birth certificate, I was not surprised, but certainly shaken when I read your name. Back in the late 1970s, while I was a US Army linguist in Germany, I obtained non-identifying information about my birth mother from the Chicago Foundlings home. They said that my mother, who on my birth date was 22 years old, was of German descent, apparently of the Unitarian faith and an, an aspiring artist a healthy, blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl who had the appearance of a cute Dutch girl. And I said, though I have misplaced the original letter in a file somewhere at home, I can recite the entire letter verbatim from memory. A few days ago, while I tried to balance 54 years of wonder with a considerable amount of reluctance, I entered my birth mother's name into a proprietary database I had access to as an attorney, and I discovered your Washington State marriage certificate, which through a circuitous path and a bit of critical thinking and searches led me to find out exactly where you are and how to obtain your email address. Who would have thunk it? If December 23rd, 1957 rings a bell, hopefully it won't cause a cataclysm, would you please let me know? Please understand I have an absolute and unequivocal respect for you and your family's privacy. I do not by any means want to be an interloper, a pest, an annoyance, or otherwise cause any anxiety or turmoil. And I went on. So I sent the email. The next day, we are on our way up. My wife and my youngest child and I were up in the, the van, up, uh, uh, heading up to our farm up in Wisconsin. And uh, my phone rang on 94. 
And I pulled the car over and I answered and I said, hello. And she said, is this John? I said, yep. She said, this is Virginia. And uh, for an hour and a half, we were on the phone and a couple of days later, she was on a plane to Chicago and she, you know, she, she spent, she spent a week with us here. She identified my birth father, who he was. And I, I discovered I have a brother and a sister in Chicago. I also discovered I come from a long line of cranks and alcoholics. My grandfather on my mother's side was an alcoholic lawyer who died of alcoholic insanity in a sanitarium not too far out of Seattle, Washington. Her two sisters are alcoholics, recovering in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. For the past nine years, I've talked to my mother one hour every single day. I see her four or five times a year, and uh, we're very, very close. She never had any other children. It all came around full circle. And I talk a lot in, in meetings. Joanne said that, you know, you hear me talk a lot. I, I am as I am as in love with Alcoholics Anonymous, as enthralled with the people, as, admirable, admi as admiring of the book and of people's courage as I was the first day I came into this program. I came into this program 38 years and some months ago, and I was absolutely helpless. I was insane. I was physically on the cusp of my deathbed. I had no hope. I had no future, and I had a past that was irreconcilable. It was irreconcilable. There was darkness inside of me that I didn't think anybody would ever be able to sh shine any light into. And I hate to be talking you know, in metaphors, but dark is dark, and it was bad. To the newcomers that are in this room, I want you to understand something. It doesn't matter that if you have a day, if you have a week, if you have a month, if you have a year. It doesn't matter if you're a horse thief, a car thief, if you've been in love with your neighbor's Doberman Pinscher. It doesn't matter what you've done. The darkness that you've known in your past, we, you're going to hear us. At some point, you're going to trust us. At some point, you are going to trust us and you're going to share, and you're going to hear us laughing, and you're going to wonder the first time if we're insulting you, and you'll find out that no, we're not. We're going to laugh with you because we understand the pain, and we understand the relief you are about to feel when you find out that you've landed in an August organization where no matter what you've done and no matter how far the scale that you've gone, there's going to be somebody in the meeting that's going to tell their story and outdo you every single time. And we love you and we care about you because we've been exactly where you are. We know what it's like not to have a drink today and to feel like you're going to blow apart at the joints like the Tin Man. We know what it's like not to feel <clears throat> part of something or part of anything. I came in here broken. And today, that's just not my lot in life. I have a life today. <clears throat> that far, far exceeds anything that anybody ever promised me. I, it some, sometimes I simply disbelieve that this has happened to me. I've been able to live an entire lifetime without alcohol thanks to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the intervention of some very strong men who showed me nothing but love, kindness, sincerely, simply because they wanted, they wanted to care about me, to see me go through what they were able to go through. And as a way of closing, I want to tell the newcomers, Marcus, we have a newcomer in the room tonight, folks. Marcus has got one day. This is day one. He was in another meeting with me earlier. Marcus, this is the beginning of a journey that I envy you for. And you might think, and I envy any newcomer. Why would I envy you? Because you're about to experience something that is going to blow your mind. I started on a journey 38 years ago, and I had the slightest idea what was going to happen. And what has happened defies any explanation I can possibly give other than at 10, 10 p.m. on September 19th, 1983, my higher power looked down on me 
And he said to himself, this one is so sick that if I do not save him, he will surely die and I have better things in store for him. And he did. And yours has saved you. You just don't know it yet. If you come to meetings, you read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous or listen to it online, listen to it on YouTube. If you get a sponsor and if you start working the steps, just do your best, just start. And if you don't pick up that first drink one day at a time and you make your goal every day, hitting the pillow at night sober, things are gonna happen to you beyond your wildest imagination. All your dreams are gonna come true. And what you're going through now, the, the, the agony of getting sober, what you're going through now, you're going to be able to take this. And down the road, you're going to be able to help young men or ladies, you'll be able to help young women and you will save their lives. And someday down the road, long after you're dead, some young kid like me will be in a meeting and they'll be imitating you as the person who saved their life. And your name will live on, your goodwill will live on, your pain will be the source of healing for many, many people, more people than you can ever possibly imagine. I like to close like this. Laughing Bear, I know you're listening up there in the land of cold. We miss you, and we know you're busy, and we know you're happy. Mary Ellen Pickles, I salute your strength and your persistence. You're a young woman who I really do admire. Anne S., you've been through a lot of shit, Anne, in the past year. I love you, and you're woohoo, and you're known all over the internet as woohoo, and you got 30 plus years of sobriety. You run a business full of all kinds of recalcitrant people and you keep it going. Tom Wicks, you've been inspiring to me because you're full of wisdom. You really are. And I really value your guidance and your friendship. Joanne, your, your mother patience in Zoom, mother patience. You've got that moon up over your shoulder and your mother patience. And Vita, God, I love watching you smoke cigarettes, Vita. Vita, I could I can taste that smoke going in. And I just, I love the fact that you could smoke cigarettes and love it so much. And Candace, I'm glad you've got shutters. Lizzie, you're making a life for yourself in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I envy the joy that I see in you every day. And Robbie Lee, you got my heart, man. I know you got your struggles, but you provide so much leadership and guidance and encouragement to people. And if we forget what's really going on, Jersey Joe will always be there with his big book to whack me over the head and set me straight. And then after I get a resentment about it, he can invite me to come and meditate about the fate of my future. And Melissa, if you ever need a quotation, I think she's a librarian. And she's so classy and classic that she's always, I mean, where else are you going to see somebody who's still wearing one of those nice, nice sweaters with the little round mother of pearl like buttons? I love it. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love all of you. And I know I've talked a little bit over my time. And I just want to say, Marcus, this is day one. Things are going to happen to you beyond your wildest imagination. All your dreams are going to come true. And if you don't believe me, stay in the after meeting. Max in exotic South Jersey, he'll be here to tell you all about how wonderful it's going to get. Thanks for letting me share. Thanks for taking an hour out of your day. And Alcoholics Anonymous, thank you for giving me such a great life.